Taylor of Gloucester, written by Beatrix Potter, illustration by David Gorgonson. In the time of swords and periwigs and full skirted coats with flowered lapets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold lace waistcoats of Padusois and Tefita, there lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westgate Street, cross-legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snippeted, piecing out his satin and pompadour. And lustering stuffs had strange names, and were very expensive in the days of Taylor of Gloucester. But although he sewed fine silk for his neighbors, he himself was very, very poor. A little old man in spectacles with a pinched face, old crooked fingers, and a suit of threadbare clothes. He cut his coat without waste according to his embroidered cloth. There were very small ends and snippets lay about upon the table. Two narrow breaths for knots except waistcoats for mice, said the tailor. One bitter cold day near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat. A coat of cherry-colored corded silk embroidered with pansies and roses and a cream-colored satin waistcoat trimmed with gauze and green worst chanel for the mayor of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked and he talked to himself. He measured the silk and turned it round and round and trimmed it into shape with his shears. The table was all littered with cherry-colored snippets. No breath at all and cut on the cross. It is no breath at all. Tippets for mice and ribbons for mobs for mice, said the tailor of Gloucester. When the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes and shut out the light, the tailor had done his day's work. All the silk and satin cut, lay cut upon the table. There were twelve pieces for the cut and four pieces for the waistcoat, and there were pocket flaps and cuffs and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat there was fine yellow taffeta, and for the buttonholes of the waistcoat there was cherry-colored twist, and everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient, except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry-colored twisted silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark, for he did not sleep there at night. He fastened the window and locked the door and took away the key. No one lived there at night but little brown mice, and they ran in and out without any keys. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester, there are little mouse staircases and secret trap doors, and the mice run from house to house through those long, narrow passages. They can run all over the town without going into the streets. But the tailor came out of his shop and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite nearby in College Court, next to the doorway to College Green, and although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called Simkin. All day long while the tailor was out at work, Simkin kept house by himself, and he also was fond of the mice, though he gave them no satin for coats. Meow, said the cat when the tailor opened the door. Meow, the tailor replied. Simkin, we shall make our fortune, but I am worn to rabbling. Take this grout, which is our last fourpence, and Simkin, take a china pimpkin. Buy a penny worth of bread and a penny worth of milk and a penny worth of sausages. And oh, Simkin, with the last penny of our fourpence, buy me one penny of cherry colored silk, but do not lose the last penny of the fourpence, Simkin, or I am done, undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. Then Simkin, said again, meow, and took the gout and the pipkin and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth and talked to himself about that wonderful coat. I shall make my fortune to be by, cut by us, and the mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning. He hath ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta, and the taffeta sufficient. There is no more left over in snippets than will serve to make tippets for mice. Then the tailor started for suddenly interrupting him. From the dresser on the other side of the kitchen came a number of little voices. Tip-tap, 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 tip. Now what can that be? said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered in crockery and pumpkins, willow pattern plates and teacups and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening and peering through the spectacles. Again, from under a teacup came those funny little voices. Tip-tap, 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 tip. This is very peculiar, said the tailor of Gloucester, and he lifted up the teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little live lady mouse and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down from the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands and mumbling to himself. The waistcoat is cut out of peach-colored satin and tambour, stitch and rosebuds and beautiful silk floss. Was I wise to entrust my last four pence of Simkin? One and twenty buttonholes of cherry-colored twist. But all at once from the dresser they 
there came other little noises. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap tip. This is passing extraordinary, said the tailor of Gloucester, and turned over another teacup, which was upside down. One out stepped a little gentleman mouse and made a bow to the tailor. Then from all over the dresser came a chorus of little tappings, all sounding together and answering one another like watch beetles in the old warning window shutter. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap tip, and out from under teacups and from under bowls and basins stepped up on except other and more little mice who hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down close over the fire, lamenting, One in twenty buttonholes of cherry-colored soap to be finished by noon on off Saturday, and this is Tuesday evening. Was it right to let loose those mice undoubtedly the property of Simpkin? Alack, I am undone, for I have no more twist. The little mice came out again and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They whispered to one another about the taffeta lining and about the little mouse tippets. And then all at once they ran away together down the passage behind the wainscot, squeaking and calling to one another as they ran from house to house. Not one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen when Simpkin came back with a pimpkin of milk. Simpkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
From the tailor shop in Westgate came a glow of light, and when Simpkin crept up to peep in the window, it was full of candles. There was, there was a snippeting of scissors and snappeting of thread, and little mouse voices sang loudly and gaily. Four and twenty sailors went to catch a snail. The best man amongst them durst not touch her tail. She put out her horns like a little Chloe cow. Run, tailors, run, or she'll have you all her now. Then, without a pause, a little mouse voices went on again. Sieve my lady's oatmeal, grind my lady's flour, put it in a chestnut, let it stand an hour. Meow, meow, interrupted Simkin as he scratched the door, but the key was under the tailor's pillow. He could not get in. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down and spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my fine little men, making coats for gentlemen? Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. Mew, mew, cried Simkin. Hey, diddle dinkity, answered the little voice. Hey, diddle dinkity, poppity pet, the merchants of London, they wear scarlet. Silk in the collar and gold in the hem, so merrily marched the merchant men. They clicked their thimbles to mark the time, but none of the songs pleased Simkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop. Then I bought a pimpkin and a popkin and a slipkin and a slopkin and all for one farthing. And upon the kitchen dresser, added the rude little mice. Meal, scratch, scratch, scuffled Simpkin at the window sill, while the little mice inside sprang to their feet and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices. No more twist, no more twist. And they barred up the sh window shutters and shut out Simpkin. But all through the nicks and the shutters, he could hear the click of thimbles and the little mouse voices singing. No more twist, no more twist. Simpkin came away from the shop and went home considering in his mind. He found the poor old tailor without fever sleeping peacefully. Then Simpkin went out on tiptoe and took a little parcel of silk out of the teapot and looked at the moonlight and he felt quite ashamed of his badness compared with those little good mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing which he saw upon the patchwork quilt was a skin of cherry-colored twisted silk and beside his bed stood the repentant Simpkin. Alack, I am worth to the raveling, said the tailor of Gloucester. But I have my twist. The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed and came out into the street with Simkin running before him. The starlings twistled on the chimney stacks and the throstles and robins sang, but they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung at the night. Luck, said the tailor, I have my twist and no more strength nor time. Then will serve to make one single buttonhole for this Christmas day in the morning. The mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon, and where is his cheery colored coat? He unlocked the door of the little shop in Westgate Street, and Simpkin ran in like a cat that expects something. But there was no one there, not even one little brown mouse. The boards were crept clean, the little ends of the thread and the little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone from off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout. There were where he left the plain cuttings of silk. There lay the most beautifulest coat and embroidered satin waistcoat that had ever been worn by Mayor Gloucester. There were roses and pansies upon the... The facing of the coat and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except just one single cherry-colored buttonhole, and where that buttonhole was wanting, there was a pinned a scrap of paper with these words in teeny tiny writing, No More Twist. And from then began the luck of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout and he grew quite rich. He made the most wonderful waistcoats for all the rich merchants of Gloucester and for all the fine gentlemen of the country road. Never were seen such ruffles and such embroidered cuffs and lapets. But his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of all. The stitches of those buttonholes were so neat, so neat. I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches of those buttonholes were so small, so small they looked as if they had been made by little mice.